to think how far I've gone driving around the world telling stories for National Geographic. There's beans over there, field edge, there's some good grass. I think we still could find some birds up in it and we're gonna get a little bit closer to that food source. Hot Creek, it's kind of surprising how the clarity of the stream can fluctuate. Hello sportsmen, uh, today I've got wild game wontons I wanna make for you. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live wide open telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. The state of Minnesota has a varied landscape. In the aptly named Rock County, there's 1,000 acres of tall grass prairie that has been preserved and protected. Thanks to the efforts spearheaded, by a notable conservationist. World-renowned photographer Jim Brandenburg grew up in the small southwestern Minnesota town of Laverne. And while his images are preserved in the Jim Brandenburg Gallery at the Rock County Veterans Memorial Building, he's also left his mark in the landscape, preserving a piece of the prairie just down the road from the small farmhouse he grew up in. I hate to say it's a, almost a spiritual experience for me, partly because I was born right here. And to think how far I've gone driving around the world telling stories for National Geographic, and then I come back here, and I have a deeper feeling than anywhere I go, and it's partly because of growing up here. But I knew it was a special place. It's high and, and it's expansive. It's two, two miles here with one little tiny farm on it, which my cousin lived on. The Brandenburg Prairie Foundation purchased the farm along with three other prairie plots from private landowners. The 1,000 acre track became the Touch the Sky Prairie and is part of the Northern Tallgrass Prairie National Wildlife Refuge, managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This was the very first piece that was established back in 2001. It's still one of the largest, I think second largest track. I remember my father talking about all the broken plow plowshares he had when he plowed the, the adjacent fields here, planting corn and soybeans. And those big rocks that you see popping up here now is the reason why this prairie exists. And every rock has a story. You can see polished corners of them where the bison would rub for thousands of years. Images Brandenburg has taken at Touch the Sky line the walls at his gallery. While striking artwork often tells a story, sometimes they're only known to the artist. There are some that are very private, intimate experiences I've had that most people don't know what happened behind it. There's one in particular that is quite remarkable but in my experience, in my memory. Uh, I came here for my father's funeral a few years ago and I looked up and there was a cloud that started to develop. It looked like a, an eagle or an angel or something. It looked very, very conspicuously, not a big, typical cloud. And I grabbed my still camera because it was like a vertical shot. So I grabbed my still camera, shot three, four really quick frames and I often think, Dad's saying, everything's okay, Jim, thanks a lot. It's almost like a religious experience for me to photograph nature when the light is right and there's some context to it. It's almost like praying in a funny way. Uh, it, there's some kind of a, an expression of giving thanks or asking for something or documenting it to share with other people or just share with myself. And it's nice to know that, you know, photography 
uh, made a difference. Of all the work I've done around the world with my photographs, I'm never sure what difference it makes. But I know for a fact it made a difference here. There might be a buffalo rub, a bison rub. There might be one over here. See how smooth it is right here? On these prominent pointed areas of almost every rock up here is extremely shiny. And this would be a congregation point for bison because it's up high. So they're up here rubbing and over thousands of years it gets polished. But you see that that's been knocked off. The native folks found they take a rock, hit that because it's polished, that breaks off, that edge is knife sharp. And they use it as a tool for scraping a bison hide. Or... So the bison polished their own, their own uh, scalpels. Mark Dayton, Governor Mark Dayton's uncle, gave something in the very beginning to help with this. So I, I think it's interesting that we're here today because of the governor's opening. Here we are, there's an event happening and we're out here talking about prairies, even though it's about pheasant hunting, which is allowed here. It isn't just preserving prairies and talking about pretty flowers and birds. It's another part of our culture where it's important uh, experience of hunting, which I grew up with and it's, it's crucial to our American experience. And we can share that too. We were in Laverne for the Governor's Pheasant Hunting Opener and had an invite the next morning to hunt some prime private land owned by Nobles County Pheasants Forever President Scott Rawl. To say my optimism was at its peak is an understatement. We're about to walk a really nice piece of habitat here and we're excited, we got a good wind. It's nice and cool here. Dogs are gonna have a good time. Here we go. Ooh, it's a deep one. Oh, there goes a pheasant right there. So there's the first rooster right there. Now the key to successful pheasant hunting in my mind is paying close attention to the dog and noticing when she disappears completely into a creek. Now, as our cameraman Dylan gets ready to cross, I reach out to grab the camera and he loses his footing. It was deep, cold, and hard to see. <laughs> Losing the camera wouldn't be our only issue this morning. As we near the end, we're all in the perfect position as a rooster flushes right at me. I got an easy shot, I just need the bird to clear the other hunters, and then my gun misfires. After closer inspection, a rusty action from a very wet duck hunt earlier in the year was to blame. Chalk it up to a depressing case of operator error. After lunch and a good gun cleaning, Dylan and I considered packing up. We'd gotten some good footage, and I'd met somebody I'd admired my entire life. We just didn't capture a successful pheasant hunt. Then I thought about all the roosters we heard the day before it touched the sky and decided, hey, let's try hunting there. So I've been able to hunt some pretty unique places in the world and to have a spot like this in Minnesota is actually really cool because it's not that far from anywhere if you, if you live in this state. And it's definitely a different pheasant hunting. I mean, you're still walking grass, you're walking blue stems, cattails, but all this rock, and this waterfall that we've heard about, we've never seen it. I don't, I don't think it's a huge waterfall by any means, but to see a waterfall down here in southwestern Minnesota, I think it's gonna be pretty neat. It's been a fun hunt. We haven't seen a ton of birds on this spot, but uh, it's not always about pulling the trigger a lot. Sometimes it's just about seeing new country. If you look on the other side of this river, there's beans over there, field edge, or some good grass. We got corn up ahead of us. I think we still could find some birds up in here. We're gonna get a little bit closer to that food source. It's later in the day. Hopefully they'll be coming back out. Kind of work our way up along this corn. 
We might find a bird along the edge here. And good girl, good girl. Oh, there might be another one. Hen, second hen right there. Yeah, you could see it right off the corner of that cornfield. The ears went up, tail went crazy. The hens gave us some much needed action, but we were hoping the corn would produce some roosters. It had been a long day. I was tired, Mika was tired. Dylan was dutifully following along with the camera. We were running out of daylight and motivation. We were as far away from the trucks as possible, and none of us were looking forward to the walk back as the cover was thinning out, and I really wasn't very confident that we'd find any more pheasants. In case she ran past them, let's cut back up and walk up through the grass here. Hen, hen! Good girl, Meeks. Good girl. Well, that was pretty cool. Gosh, we've pretty much given up on this piece. All of a sudden, Mika's ears popped up. Where's your boyfriend? Come on. There he is. Woo! There's an opening day rooster. Boy, I tell you what. It's funny how how hunting can go. It's been a long day today. It's been fun, but we've had our share of ups and downs. Uh, for the most part, we've been getting beat by the birds. Well, see, I can't even hold on to them. We've been walking this piece. In fact, we walked through this spot earlier and uh, didn't see any birds. And Mika's tired, I'm tired. Day's almost over. We're almost back to the vehicles. And one thing I always tell people is always finish the walk. Don't give up early. And man, we were about to get, well, I'm not gonna say we were about to give up, but we were definitely giving up hope as we were close to the truck. And all of a sudden Mika's ears popped up, two hens popped up, and I hoped there'd be a rooster with him. And there he is. Got one opening day rooster and Mika's birdie again. We're not done yet, folks. Let's see if we can get one more. She doesn't want to give up. Glad my gun worked. Woo -hoo -hoo! Oh man, that's awesome. We walked this whole piece and didn't get any shots. We flushed some birds wild, got some close looks at some hens. Walked all the way back, we got almost all the way back to the vehicles, flushed two hands, shot a rooster, and then bumped up two more birds. Best part about that last rooster is I shot that first one, and I was down to two shells in my gun, and I was, I forgot about it. Uh, I, was, I was walking back, it's like, you know, I may want to throw that third shell in just in case. And that rooster got up, and I hit him with the first shot, and saw both his legs drop, he kept trucking. Shot at him again and missed, and then way out there, that third shot. I'm glad I had third shot in. Nick is bringing it back to us right now. We got a Minnesota limit, opening day. Touch the sky, Laverne, Minnesota. While the day started with disaster, this hunt turned out to be one of my favorites of the year. He's gonna put up some more birds. We might get a little show on our way back. We're almost to the vehicles, we're almost there. That's where we got our two birds. She's gonna put up another one, watch this. Always finish the walk. It just goes to show you that when you're making an outdoor TV show, you can't script everything. Awesome. You just never know how things are gonna go. So cool. It's a lot of nutrients and sediment that are flowing into the water. So that often leads to algae blooms or in decreased clarity. I take that cooked material with the cream cheese, a little other flavoring that's added to it.
Hi, I'm Lisa County, and I love the outdoors to hunt, fish, paddle, hike, and it's all made possible through the abundance of nature. Natural resource organizations work hard to protect our waterways and wildlife habitats, but what can you and I do to make a difference? Prairie Sportsman presents Conservation DIY. Minnesota has nearly 12,000 lakes and 6,500 miles of rivers and streams. That's a lot of water to keep an eye on. That's why Minnesota residents are helping the Pollution Control Agency measure the water clarity of lakes and streams. Now in its 45th year, the Citizen Water Monitoring Program has more than 1,400 volunteers. Uh, volunteers monitor water clarity, which is a good indication of lake or stream health. Uh, it looks at sediment levels or algae levels in the water, and if those levels are too high, it can impact recreation and wildlife, fish and wildlife communities. Oh, well, it's a lot of nutrients and sediment that are flowing into the water. So that often leads to algae blooms or in decreased clarity, which affects people's interest in swimming and fishing in the water, and then it just affects overall lake health for wildlife. The data collected by citizen monitors is used directly by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to determine if a lake or stream is meeting state water quality standards. It's one of the key things that we look at. Prairie Sportsman went out with Hawk Creek Watershed Project technician and a volunteer who monitor waters in Renville, Candy Ojai, and Chippewa counties. There's two things that are done around the state. One is lake-based and one is stream-based. What I'm doing here is stream monitoring. The, to start monitoring, you will uh, lower a bucket off of a bridge, collect a sample, uh, bring it up, and then you'll pour it into what's called a secchi tube, and then you'll lower the disc slowly, and then once it starts to disappear, you'll look at the uh, marks. It's a 100 centimeter tube, and then you'll raise it up until you can barely see it, and then you'll take the average in between those, and that will be your clarity reading. Hot Creek, in this location, it's kind of surprising how how wildly the, the, the clarity of the stream can fluctuate. You know, it's expected that summertime you'll, you'll see some algae growth and so forth, but uh, um, you get a large rain up by Wilmer or Raymond or Clara City, it's amazing the changes that happen down here. So it's a little concerning. It's a natural process to some degree, and what do you do? But uh, keep track of it and try to learn from it. As you get farther north, when you have less pressures of development and agriculture, your, the water quality is better. And as we move farther south down the state, where there's higher levels of development and agriculture, we've got higher levels of impaired water. We will work with landowners um, to do best management projects, um, or BMPs as we call them, to, to help improve water quality. That's our main goal. And so I do the monitoring and then we have people in our office that will meet with the Lando and kind of go over and maybe they have an erosion problem, what we can do to fix that. We also traveled to Big Candy Ojai Lake, where David Peterson serves as a citizen water monitoring volunteer. Well, what got me involved in water monitoring was part of the Lake Association board. Uh, we wanted, to, if we were going to test the water for quality, we also wanted to know clarity. I mean, you know, what's in it and, you know, and, and what happens. I mean, if we want to do any improvements or even look to get help to do improvements, we've got to have a baseline of you know where to start from. Well, what an average citizen, and not even just a lake owner, but average citizen can do, and there was just an article in the local paper about that. I mean, with grass clippings alone. You know, maybe people don't think about that, but when you blow your grass clippings into the street, uh, they wash down the drain, and you know the grass clippings won't probably make it to the uh, lake or the you know, our water system, ecosystem, but the, when they decompose, all of the phosphorus, you know, and, and decomposition products will make it to the lake. I mean, so that's a small thing that, even if you don't live on a lake, you can do. You can do a lot of things to protect your water quality. Um, it, a lot of it can be based on where you live. So be conscious of how you're taking care of your lawn. That's a really big one. Putting in a rain garden, not over fertilizing your lawn, making sure to pick up pet waste and cleaning up leaf litter. Those are all things that directly impact lakes and streams. And if you do that and you get your neighbors to do that, you can have a really positive impact. We, we are constantly gathering data, information about our water quality and it's, it's just an ongoing process. We have just vast amounts of information already, but we still need a lot more and it it's changes over time. So it's not, you just can't go out and collect data one time. Uh, years down the road, things can change. So we to have to keep doing it on a regular basis. Well, I'm sure there are a number of lakes and streams that don't have volunteers. People can go on our website 
and find lakes and areas that still are looking for monitors. So there are opportunities out there. But I think we're proud of our water resources, our lakes and our streams, and uh, we want to do what we can to protect and improve them where they need improving. And it's, there are a lot of people out there that uh, want to help out, and it's, it's actually kind of a fun job in a way if you like to get out into the field and, and uh, doing something that's interesting but also very worthwhile to uh, you know, contribute to our, our state's uh, natural resources. Anybody can be a volunteer in the program. It doesn't require any prior training or equipment. The Pollution Control Agency provides all of that. So we just, anybody with an interest in water uh, and, and that visits uh, lake or stream regularly, we, are, we would love to have you as a volunteer. Hello sportsmen, uh, today I've got wild game wontons I want to make for you. And I'm going to do a little show and tell here, so follow with me real quick. In the recipe that I had that I explained, I'm telling you to lay out nine at a time, but I'm giving you the idea that a portion would be five. As you can see here, I, most of us will eat five of them, I would say, especially me. The thing I want to point out though, I bought these wonton skins at the store and they're not very expensive but sometimes after you get them uh, whether they're in the freezer case or the fresh vegetable case you might notice that they'll have this whitish area around them. Now the only time I want you to get scared is if this that's actually like a freezer burn or dryness that's happened. Yes oil will help in some cases here when it's on the edge but if it gets closer to the center you're going to have to dispose of them or chop them into fine pieces and fry them to make little crouton-like material that you can throw on a salad. But here's how this begins. Uh, you'll see I had some made. I'll show you how I wrap them, but I'm going to put them in oil. 350 degrees is what you're using. I'm just using a little fry daddy. Now you see a little white on here. That's the cornstarch. That helps uh, when I'm folding and wrapping. It keeps them from sticking or binding. Here is an egg that has just a touch of water in it and then whip it up a little bit with a fork. Uh, at work they used to call it egg wash. That's the chef used to teach me. That was egg wash. So all I'm going to do is I got to wet the side of this. Inside this material, this was a block, that recipe will be a block of cream cheese, roughly the same volume of chopped up cooked wild game. You know how you clean your carcass, you get these little scraps. Now be careful of uh, anything that would be considered too chewy. Uh, but I season it, roast it in the oven, and at that point now I have material to work with. And I take that cooked material with the cream cheese, a little other flavoring that's added to it, and I'm going to fold these in half, and you're just pressing the sides. You want them to adhere. That egg will help that adhere down so at that point you're going to be able to fry them. What you're hoping to avoid is leakage. Now you'll notice that if you're in the fryer and this unit starts to leak you'll see that white start oozing out just like you're cooking mozzarella sticks or some sort of cheese. But we're going to want to get these to a golden brown and yes you might have to help them and flip them because you don't have them naturally weighted and even on both sides. Now when you do it, and you get a package, and it's like 50, 60 units in this package, uh, and I'm telling you to do nine at a time so they don't get dry on you, so you get them fast enough, and you get them onto a plate. It can even be a paper plate. Line it with a little cornstarch. Wrap it with plastic. You could put these in the freezer. They last for months, and they're an easy, quick grab when you have to entertain. So if you're like me, you maybe end up having... A little quick company show up. Now I can take my tray, take my stuff, got a little room for dip. These don't really require any dip. They're going to have plenty of flavor in them. But the great thing about it is you can play with that too. You can add all sorts of material to that to create a, to create a real zippy or zesty or snappier flavor. Now, let me go like this. If you notice, 
even some of those that had that dryness, this is all that happened on the edge. They get that little bit of, little bit of look, which happens to be nice and crispy for us. So we transfer these rascals over, just like so. And I want to show you what they look like on the inside, but I got to be careful. These are hot. But let's, uh, let's snap one here so you get an idea what it looks like inside. If you've added that mozzarella into that cream cheese and I've got the same amount of meat versus cream cheese, what I end up with is a product that's going to be nice and creamy and tasty. And when I pull it apart and eat it now, it's not going to, it's not going to ooze out onto anybody's clothing or anything like that. It'll be easy to the bite, easy to eat. I hope you get uh, inspired by this and take a chance to give it a try. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live wide open telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Best hunting in extreme southwestern Minnesota.